dream of a legendary land haunts mankind like a timeless mirage. Some call it Atlantis, some Eden, some Zion, some Tibet. For Columbus, it was India, and for millions, India, it remains. The soil of India can be spotted easily, but what of India's soul? Everyone who has been to India, been physically dunked in its chemistry, agrees. India is different. I remember my first visit as if it were yesterday the long ride from the Delhi airport. It was the smells that were the strangest, a blend of cow dung and curry rising from a half million cooking fires in the dusty evening air. Was my heart pounding or was it strangely quiet as I realized I'm here? What was it that made this place, these people so different while at the same time making me think I know them? I've always known them. A part of me seems to have been here from the beginning. My first weeks in India were manic. Days weren't long enough for me to drink in the sights. I had known exotic tribes before, but here was an entire civilization that was exotic. was India's secret, the clue to her distinctiveness. I could never put my finger on what makes India different because the answer seemed to be everything. Even yogis with hair so long it's worn like a turban. Everything about India is different because India seems to include everything. All the main racial types have been caught in her deep net. Blacks in the south shade into wheat-colored Brahmins in the north. While in language there are so many that English must be imported for general use. Only Bangladesh and Pakistan are poorer but within this sea of poverty rise islands of temple wealth that take our breath away. On the whole, yesterday is more visible than tomorrow, with millions following a way of life that can be traced back 4,000 years. Alongside the ox cart and wooden plow stands a nation in some ways as modern as Air India. Startling purity contrasts with equally startling license. Naked voluptuaries on temple friezes by with naked ascetics stretched on beds of nails. The paradoxes extend right up to God. 
330 million deities sounds like polytheism gone haywire until we learn that nothing but the one true God even exists. What a bewildering chaos, what a jungle of life and thought like the faces of her temples that leave not an inch uncarved, India swarms with life and vitality. Nothing seems to have been overlooked, nothing excluded. And this may be the key to what makes India different. For if the visible India excludes nothing, that in the invisible that excludes nothing is the infinite. The soul of India is the infinite. Philosophers tell us that the Indians were the first to conceive of a true infinite from which nothing is excluded. The West shied away from this notion. The West likes form, boundaries that distinguish and divide. The trouble, though, is that boundaries also imprison. They restrict and confine. India saw this clearly and turned her face towards that which has no boundaries whatever. her soul in the infinite, seeing the things of the world as masks that the infinite assumes. There can be no end of these masks, of course, if they are to express a true infinity. And it's here that India's mind-boggling variety links up with her infinite soul. India includes so much because her soul, being infinite, excludes nothing. It goes without saying that the universe India saw emerging from this infinite was stupendous. This ancient observatory in Delhi reminds us that while the West was still thinking of the world as perhaps 6,000 years old, India was already envisioning ages and eons and galaxies as numerous as the sands of the Ganges, a universe so vast that modern astronomy slips into its folds without a ripple. But it's not the universe as a whole that interests us most. It's our part of it, our own planet and our life upon it. The way India saw the infinite registering its limitlessness and its parts is in the variety it pours into every corner. Take religion, for example. India assumed as a matter of course that there will be many, and she made room for them to a degree no other culture quite had. Her basic tradition is, of course, Hinduism, but how numerous its companions. Buddhism, which spread to light all Asia, began here at Bodh Gaya. This tree is said to have rained blossoms the whole night that Buddha was enlightened beneath it. Jainism, which surfaced as a protest against Hinduism, soon settled into the role of a respected cousin. Indian Christianity goes back through the disciple Thomas to Christ himself. And even after the partition of Pakistan and Bangladesh, there are almost as many Muslims in India as in the entire Arab world. The Sikhs here waving the whisk of royalty over their Bible, the Granth, which they regard as their living guru, worked out a kind of compromise between Hinduism and Islam. 
कंठ लाए अवकुन सब मेटे दयाल पुरुष दुख सिन्न रहो जो मांगे ठाकुर अपने ते सोई सोई देवे and Parsis or Zoroastrians continue right down to today, the religion of the Magi who followed the star towards the Christ child's birth. The historian of religion can find almost anything he wants in India, enacted with intensity. When we go on vacation, we tend to seek out rest or adventure. The Indian goes on pilgrimage, not always, but far oftener than we do. The last religious festival I attended in India drew some 20 million pilgrims in its month's duration. The religious strands that assembled were varied, but somehow they fit together like roles in a single drama. telling his followers the Lord can be addressed by any name that tastes sweet to your tongue or pictured in any form that appeals to your sense of wonder and awe. You can sing to him as Shakti, Jesus, or Allah, as the formless or the master of all forms. It makes no difference at all. He is the beginning, the middle, and the end the basis, substance, and source. It isn't only in religious persuasion that people differ, of course. These men and women lining the bathing ghats of Banaras are all Hindus, but how different they are. They differ in physique, but India looked past their bodies into their minds where she found the prolificness of the infinite exploding like a Roman candle. No other civilization saw, appreciated, and classified so precisely the full spectrum of human personality types, an achievement that has earned for India the title of the world's introspective psychologist. The key to this psychological perceptiveness is her recognition of the extent to which people differ and the degree to which these differences are to be respected. To begin with, people differ in wanting different things. Some of us want pleasure, others success, others to do well what needs to be done, and still others want to be saved. Different as these desires are, India holds that all have their place. The only point is not to get stuck on the lower rungs of the ladder. Another way we differ from one another is the stage of life we're at. And again, India cherishes all these stages. Every civilization delights in the magic years of childhood and the questing nesting stages of youth and maturity the roominess of the Indian outlook comes in its regard for our later years as well. India prizes them as potentially the best years of all, explicitly freeing them for the pursuit of our true adult education so that before life is over, we can understand what it's all about. All of us move through life stages, but we do so as different kinds of persons, different personality types. India identified four such types and once again honored all of them. Likening society to an organism, she pictured Brahmins as its head. Brahmins are intellectuals. Their chief delight is in art, ideas, and things of the spirit generally. Next come the arms and shoulders of society its administrators, persons who have a talent for getting things done. A third personality type is the artisan or craftsman, the engineer and the farmer. India likens these people to society's stomach, 
for they produce and feed us with the things on which life depends. Finally, manual laborers are important too. They are the legs and feet without which society couldn't run. We differ in what we want, in the stage of life we have attained, in the kind of person we are. And finally, we differ in the way we approach God. Affective persons draw near to him by loving him, reflective persons by knowing him, active persons by serving him, and contemplative types by meditating. All four of these yogas, ways to union, reach the same summit. Which you follow depends on your spiritual temperament, the side of the mountain from which you start climbing. What climbing means in this context carries us into India's most astounding claim. To say that the source from which our universe issues is infinite is already to claim much. We have seen that it produced a cosmology that was prodigious in scope and prodigal in variety. But India didn't stop there. She went on to advance what is probably the most daring hypothesis man has ever conceived. We ourselves are the infinite, the very infinite from which the universe proceeds. This isn't apparent, of course, but everything in Hinduism works to drive the point home. It's altogether wrong to think of images like the one being paraded here in procession as idols, as if the copper itself were being worshipped. They're reminders of the God who dwells in the depths of our souls. Or take altars. Every day, devotees coat this huge rock altar in Srinagar with orange paint and decorate it with mandalas made of flower petals. But wherever an altar is raised, there is the center of the universe. The world's axis passes through it. Yet no visible altar is more than a symbol for the one true altar, the human heart. And to say that the cosmic axis pierces it is to say that it is in direct touch with the infinite. Man isn't just made in the image of God, he is God. It's difficult for us to fathom the sheer immensity of the self this notion involves. When we see ritual acts like these being performed, they look like they were directed to some far-off celestial potentate. And so they doubtless appear to beginners on the journey, but further along they seem more like alchemical formulas, a science of transformations to awaken us to the realms of gold that lie buried in our depths. For we are kings who, having fallen victim to amnesia, wander through our kingdoms in tatters, not knowing who we truly are. Or like lovers who, in their dreams, search the wide world in despair for their lost beloved, who is actually lying by their side throughout.
prospect of divinity within us doesn't provoke the Indian to dreams of power over others, only over himself. As the God within surfaces, we don't stand out more, we fit in more. Everything that comes our way begins to have the strange feel of being somehow of our own doing. We find ourselves affirming the rightness of the world just as it is. Bells announce that the ceremony is over. What remains is to carry its insight back into everyday life. efforts to uncover our infinite dimension, we have been looking at religion, but we could just as well have been parading her art, for in India the two are the same. Art is religion, religion art. Never having depended on writing to the extent we do, she found most of her sacred texts in song and dance and stone. Far from art for art's sake, her arts are strictly utilitarian. Their purpose is to inform and transform. Inform us of the way things truly are. Transform us into what we might truly be. No figure in all art is better loved than this dancing Shiva. Lord of dancers, king of actors. The cosmos is his theater. He dances unceasingly. In the twirling stars, the circling seasons, the rhythm of the human heart. Tirelessly, effortlessly, his rhythms gather time into timelessness. One art form, though, to which India was addicted, it was sculpture, perhaps because it tokens timelessness and eternity. Chiseled in rock, we are presented a relief map of the world as it would appear if we had eyes to see its mystery and promise. It works heavily against us that we associate statuary like this with art books and museums. To see its pieces as the Indians do, they must be restored to the hillsides and temples from which art collectors uproot them. We should know their ancestries and be prepared to be changed by entering their presence. We must receive them as images of what we ourselves are potentially. Remember that we are pilgrims, come from some great distance to see God. 
and that what we see will depend upon ourselves. We are to see not the likeness made by hands, but the invisible reality to which it points. We are to partake in a communion. The Indians saw no point in carving replicas of the things we usually see, ordinary, pedestrian, prosaic. Art's opportunity is to see deeper than we usually do, to see the infinite, stirring in things, warming to burst their buds. So everything in these shapes is a shade larger than life, whether the quality be power or tenderness or beauty or bliss. Images are of ones awakened and for our awakening, we who are still asleep. There is no understanding here without assimilation. To understand is to be reborn. Rivers have always been vital to India and as monsoons until recently made bridges impractical, the ferry that could carry one to the further shore became a metaphor for life. In seasons of deluge, the river's current can sweep a craft along and make it for a time seem rudderless. But in the end, our destination is sure, for nothing can outpower the infinite, and the infinite is what we finally belong to. When our journey is completed, we shall know the joy towards which our longing and our lust so blindly strove. And in that joy, we shall find our final unfathomable peace. Mark Twain once said that India is the only country under the sun that everyone desires to see and having seen it once, if only by a glimpse, will not exchange that glimpse for the shows of the rest of the world combined. Yet critics say that one of the best books that has ever been written about India, E.M. Forster's A Passage to India, was written to prove that the real India doesn't exist. Yes and no, soil and soul. India's soil lies as close as your local travel agent. As for her soul, we are told that there is a place one cannot reach by going anywhere. 